Welcome to Elevation Church. I'm Dr. Hirschberger. This is week two of our joy genome. In this session, we will be delving deep into the realm of habitual human tendencies as they contrast sharply with our heavenly duties. How to substitute a no with a yes. Replace harsh words with affirmation. And to garner joy while resisting the pull of our natural negative notions. After weeks and weeks of research, some trial and error, and countless experiments, we are excited to share with you week two of our Joy Genome Project. We have prepared a comprehensive presentation for you, and we respectfully urge you to listen closely and take comprehensive notes on what you are about to hear. It may just change your life. Thank you. Welcome today to the second week of our series, The Joy Genome. We are taking four weeks to study the subject of joy, the DNA of joy, the genetic composition of joy. And our, our laboratory for learning is the book of Philippians, which is, in my opinion, the happiest book in the Bible. And what makes the happiest book in the Bible such an enigma is that it was written from a prison cell by the Apostle Paul. Last week, I taught you a, a simple statement, uh, kind of a chorus that we could say together and, and that we could hide in our hearts and that we could build our lives on uh, as we study the, the, the traits of joy and the characteristics of joy. And I want to begin today with a review of that statement. And we're going to put it on the screen at all of our locations. And I want you to say it out loud with me. Ready? Go. My joy is not determined by what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and through me. You've got two people sitting next to you, most of you, and I want you to put, pick the best looking one and, and say it to them. All right, ready? And if you're sitting next to your wife, choose her. Just my advice. Ready? Go. My joy is not determined by what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and through me. One more time to the other person on the other side of you. My joy is not determined by what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and through me. So we're discovering together that our joy in Jesus is not a circumstantial joy built on the fault line of our feelings, but our joy in Jesus is secure and our joy in Jesus is incontrovertible and our joy in Jesus is irrevocable. Today we're going to trace the next stages of the biological evolution of joy from Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 16. Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 16. I'll read the passage in pieces and as I preach I'll show you the strand that, that, that really brings the whole thing together. And um, let's just start with these first two verses and work on that a little while. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, I love the way Paul addresses these people the majority of whom he's probably never met and will never see again as dear friends. And I know a lot of you in this church don't know me and I don't know you. In fact, I'm not even in the room with some of you as I say this. Just like Paul was nowhere near the church at Philippi when he wrote this epistle from a Roman prison cell. Uh, he did not know a lot of their children's birthdays and he didn't know a lot of personal information about them, I'm sure, in a church of that size. But he called them his friends. He cared about them. You see how he loves them and wants the best for them and instructs them out of a concern in his heart. He wants them to rise up and be all that Christ intends for them to be and to have a fullness of joy. I feel the same way about you, whether you believe it or not. I, I uh, 
count you as a friend, whether we ever get to shake hands or not. Um, that might be hard for you to understand, but there is a connection that a preacher feels with the people that he preaches to, and he wants the best for them, and he wants to see Christ formed in them, and it breaks his heart when he sees them settling for anything less than God's best for them. So I just want you to know whether we ever meet or not, I consider you a friend. Uh, I consider you a, a person with great potential, and uh, it's my goal to always instruct you in the ways of the Lord. And the Bible says that a wound from a friend can be trusted. And so sometimes when I preach hard to you and you think I don't like you or when I see, see you know, a, a reaction from you while I'm preaching like I just hurt you, um, I'm doing it because I'm a real friend who wants you to experience all Christ has intended for your life more than I ever want to be liked in any given moment by one person. So what a great way to address a group of people that you're preaching to. Dear friends, that just stood out to me as I read the passage and I couldn't gloss over it. As you have always, let's pick it back up, obeyed, which I think is a little bit of an overstatement. <laughs> it sounds like an exaggeration. I don't know what church Paul was pastoring, but I can't say that part. <laughs> I understand the friends thing, but uh, this always obey thing, not so much. As you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God. Who is it? It is God. Who is it? It is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. Let's work on that. It's good to obey Jesus when we're all together. Paul says, you obey when I'm around, but I'm not around anymore. Look over your shoulder. It's infinitely more important that you obey when we're not having church, when we're not all together. Um, anybody can have joy in here. We try to create an uplifting worship experience unless you are, are an absolutely a perpetually depressed person um, and, and absolutely negative in your view of the world, it would be very hard for you to sit through one of our worship experiences at Elevation Church unless you suck and not get a little bit of joy, just a little dose of joy, just a little drop of joy. Um, and so I was thinking about this. Isn't it so easy to have joy in here but so hard to take our joy out there? Isn't it so easy to have the joy of the Lord when we're all together and we're singing and I'm preaching. And isn't it so difficult to transfer that joy that's in here out there? And so I, I started thinking, when we sing songs here in church and we have all this joy and some of us lift our hands and we sing real loud and, and, and we make these great lofty claims about Christ and our devotion to Him, what would it be like if we would sing what we really meant instead of singing what we really want to mean. In other words, there, there's this aspiration we all have. We want to love Jesus with all of our heart and give him our all. But what if we sang the words that really reflected the way that we live when we're not in church? Paul says it's important to obey in my presence, but much more in my absence. So what I want to introduce to you for the first time ever at Elevation Church today is a little segment called What We Really Mean Worship. And this should be fun, okay? We're going to take a couple of old songs and even a couple of old hymns. Now, don't be offended. Contrary to what a lot of us believe, hymns are not the Bible. So we're going to change the word to some hymns. <laughs> this is the big one, Elizabeth. I'm coming to join you, right? <laughs> They're messing with my hymns. And... Uh, and we're going to present to you uh, a variation of what we would sing if we would sing what we really mean. Because we sing some bold stuff in church. But what if we would sing what we really mean when we're faced with the pressures of life? So I present to you at all of our locations what we really mean worship. Take it away, boys. All right, well, we're going to start with... A, uh, it might be new to y'all, but it's one of the first songs I ever led in worship. It's an old school chorus from the 90s. It's called We Fall Down. We fall down, we lay our crowns 
at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, we cry holy, 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 we cry holy, 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 we cry holy, 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 is the Lamb. We fall down, but we hold our crowns, cause we want to keep them. The greatness of the things we own. Oh, we love to have more. We cry, give me, give me, give me. We cry, give me, give me, give me. We cry, give me, give me, give me. Please give me more. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. Surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Some of me I will surrender. When I get around to it, I will sometimes love and trust Him only when it's convenient. I surrender some, and maybe even none. It all depends on how I'm feeling if I surrender some. It all depends on how I'm feeling if I surrender some. Let's give it up for what we really mean, worship. I heard a little bit, didn't it? What if we really sang what we really mean? What if we really sang how we really lived? I surrender all? Really, do you? At this church, 83% of people don't tithe. I surrender all? I surrender all? I mean, at this church, a lot of people only show up one out of every five weeks, and if anything even remotely important pops up in their kids' schedule, it takes precedence over getting them in the house of God to hear God's word. So we're more important with carting them around to play baseball, even though they're probably not going to have a major league baseball career. Spoiler alert, than getting them to the house of God. I surrender all, really? I know this is supposed to be a series on joy. But the fact is that there's a discrepancy between how we, how we express our joy when we're present with one another and when I'm standing here preaching to you and the way that most of us, most of us, I'm included in your number, live our lives when we're out there. There's a lot of joy, a lot of good intention in here. But God does not intend for our joy to just blow up in here and fizzle out before it gets out there. Because if, 
If the joy that's in here is true joy, then the joy that's in here will overflow out there. The joy that Jesus works in us will work its way out of us and will change the world that we live in if we can bridge the gap between what we sing and what we mean or what we profess and the way that we live. Somebody in this church say amen. amen. Now, um, if we try, Paul says, to work out something that God hasn't first worked in us, it will be ineffective. That's called legalism. When we try to work out what God has not first worked in us, that's called legalism. Religious hypocrisy. That's what the Pharisees did in the New Testament. They tried to work out some, some, some laws and some traditions that God had not truly worked in them. So Paul says the first thing about joy is that God must work it in you. It's God who's working in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. But if we do not work out what God has worked in us, that's called apathy and complacency, and it's equally offensive to God. So we can't just work it out until God works it in. That's why we must be transformed by his presence. On the other hand, we can't simply allow him to work it in, and we never work it out. Now, we don't work for our salvation. We work out our salvation. We don't work for it. God works it in us, and we work it out. Is this making any sense? It's, it's the reason a lot of you have had short-term, short-lived spiritual renewal experiences. Because you were trying to work some stuff out that God had never really worked in. That's why a lot of people who claim to know Christ only last in church for seven months. Because they're trying to work out something that God never truly worked in. If you're going to have true, lasting joy, it starts with what God works in you through the Spirit and through Christ. And then you work it out. You work it out. And so the Christian life and the process of experiencing true, full joy is about us working out what God has already worked in. Good theology. Good theology. We want to take the joy that's in here and display it out there. We don't want to just obey in the presence of one another, but we want to obey when there's no preacher preaching and there's no singers leading us in worship, we want to worship with our lives. We want to have true joy everywhere we go, right? My friend Perry Noble has this line. He says, every Sunday is like Halloween for a lot of Christians. We get dressed up and pretend like we're something we're not. I surrender all. I surrender. Shut up and get out of my way. I'm late. Less than 24 hours later, we've got road rage. We surrendered all in church. We surrendered all. So if the joy of the Lord is truly in you, it will find an expression through you, or it's not real. It's not simply something to inject you with hope in here. The joy of the Lord is meant to flow through you and change everything you touch out there. One of my favorite Bible verses is Psalm 37, 4. It says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If I sign someone's Bible from time to time, that's the verse that I write down, very meaningful to me. I see it from two different perspectives. The first is God will give me the desires of my heart, meaning that he will instill his desires in my heart and make my desires his desires. So that having joy in the Christian life isn't all about saying no to all the things you want to do, but it's making the things that God wants you to do the things that you want to do until his heart and your heart are one and the same. It's God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good purpose. He doesn't just want you to act according to his purpose. He wants you to will and to act. So he gives you the desires of your heart. He instills them, and then he fulfills them. He literally puts them there, and then he brings them to pass. And this is the essence of true 
Jesus-filled joy. Now, that's great stuff and a little challenging, but Paul makes it really painful with the next few verses. And I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't want to preach this next part. I don't want to preach it. I don't want to preach it. I want to skip it. I thought five times about changing my sermon text this week, but that's one thing about giving the creative department your scriptures weeks and months in advance. You just got to go on and preach what you told them you would preach unless you got a really good reason. And the only really good reason I could come up with not to preach this passage is because it made me feel like a hypocrite. And since I regularly make you feel like a hypocrite with the things that I preach to you, I figure turnabout is fair play and I may as well just be a hypocrite with you this week. Because what I'm about to share with you is something in my life that God has convicted me so much this week that I've done such a horrible job with that I just need to repent and, and, and preach it because it's true and then ask y'all to help me work on it together. So this is Paul's practical prescription for how to work out the joy that God has worked in our lives. And it doesn't get any more practical than verse 14. I'll read this verse and this verse only. Do everything without complaining or arguing. I don't want to preach that verse. Let's take a vote. Who votes? I just go right to verse 15. You want to just skip right over that one. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'd love to do it, and I know you'd like me to do it, but this is the, this is the outflow of the, the end growth of, of, of the whole book of Philippians is that we should do everything without complaining and arguing. And this isn't just some aphorism, some truism, some cute little proverb. This is actually a, a rich verse of scripture. And it has some roots in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 11 when the Israelites complained because they were, they were wandering in the wilderness and they wanted to eat quail. And all they ever received was, was this stuff called manna that God would send from heaven. And they complained in such a way that the Lord becomes, becomes so angry in Numbers chapter 11 that he sends fire around the edge of the camp to show them that he doesn't appreciate their attitude. And uh, that when we complain, it's really an insult to the character of Christ more than an assessment of the circumstances in our life. When we complain, it's really more of an insult to the character of Christ than it is an assessment of the circumstances in our life. If we believe he's a good God who gives good gifts and he's all-knowing and all-powerful, then we can trust him. If we don't, then we must complain, we must whine, we must argue. And uh, right after God sent the fire down, they complained again. <laughs> and, and then God dealt with them, and then they complained again, and it was just a pattern. So when Paul's readers heard this line, do everything without complaining and arguing, and there, there was a, a lot of latent meaning in that terminology, in that one instruction. Now, if I were you, I would, um, I would be a little bit like... Um, a little bit apprehensive about a preacher standing up and telling me not to complain and to do everything without complaining, especially a young preacher like me. Like, what have you been through in your life, preacher boy, with your little girly shirt with little glittery letters on it? <laughs> You're laughing because you were thinking it. I just read your mind. What do you know about doing everything without complaining. I mean, you have the perfect job. You get to work with church people for a living. First of all, that tells me you don't know anything about church people. That's the first thing that tells me. But secondly, I might be inclined to agree with you. I might be inclined to say, you're right. What do I know? Who am I to tell you not to do the things you do and to go through the things you're going through with a complaining, argumentative attitude? I mean, who am I? What do I know? I, it's easy for me to say, I've got this great calling and this awesome church and, and a beautiful family. So, so who am I to say, do everything without complaining and arguing? What do I know? It, it may be easy for me to say, but I didn't say it. <laughs> the man who said it was in a prison cell 
potentially about to get his head chopped off. And he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. So it's not about what I'm saying. It's about what he says. And he's not speaking on his own behalf. These are the words of God through a man who was in prison, potentially about to suffer execution for preaching the gospel. And he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. So we got to deal with this. And um, in this church, it never happens. We never deal with any complaints, any arguments. The people in this church never express any dissatisfaction with anything. But in other churches, I have heard. <laughs> From time to time, people become disenfranchised. And an interesting thing about Paul is no matter what you would say to him that would make you the exception for this no complaining, no arguing thing, he probably wouldn't find it a very good excuse. Like you probably don't want to make your appeal to Paul on this one. I find it interesting. It, it seems so broad. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Well, that everything seems a little broad. And funny thing is, everybody sees their thing as the exception to everything. So I studied it in the Greek. And the word everything in Greek literally means everything. <laughs> so you'd say to Paul, yeah, but you can't expect me to have joy when I have a 45-minute commute to work every morning. To which Paul might reply, I traveled 45 days once to preach in a place with, with such opposition that when I got there, they ran me out of the city by throwing rocks at me before I ever got to preach my first word. Do everything without complaining or arguing. You know, you really don't want to appeal to Paul on this one. Because whatever your exception is, it's probably not going to hold very much weight in his court of law. He has the right to say it. You know, you meet somebody once in a while, and they have it so bad, but, they, but they're so extremely good at gratitude that it puts you to shame. Paul is that kind of person. He's the kind of person that no matter how bad your everything was that you're complaining about, his thing was worse than your thing. And that's what gives him the credibility to tell you, inspired by the Spirit of God, do everything without complaining and arguing. Do everything. Yeah, but Paul... My boss is a real bad person. <laughs> My boss is, is, is so controlling and doesn't appreciate me, to which Paul would say, yeah, I'm chained to a Roman centurion, and I can't pee until he tells me I can pee. <laughs> what you want to talk about? Yeah, but Paul, my wife, is a very difficult woman to live with, Paul. And Paul would say, oh, I don't even have a wife, and the friends that I did have are now separated from me, and I'll probably never see them again because I'm in jail for the gospel. And by the way, most of the people who claim to be my friends have deserted me at this point. Do everything without complaining and arguing. What's next? Yeah, no, Paul, I'm just saying. <laughs> the economy. Paul would say, because people were, were so skeptical of the message of Jesus, I never took a paycheck from any church that I planted. I worked with my hands making tents, and I barely survived. Some nights, I, I didn't have any food to eat before I went to bed on the ground. So don't tell me your reason to complain. Tell Paul. Tell Paul. Appeal to him. I know. I know you got a reason, but, but sometimes we need to put things in perspective, people. Here's a little statement I came up with that I thought was just as good as the statement that I did last week, and this will be our new statement for this week. I, I, I thought of this this week, and it's been challenging me all week. Check it out. Happiness is a symptom of circumstances, but joy is a product of perspective. So you got to say this. God is still good. 
I will be grateful. We're going to say that whole thing together. I know a few of you want to write it down, so I'll give you just a minute to write it down. Here, here's the statement one more time in full as you write it. Happiness is a symptom of circumstance. Stocks are up. Your team wins, which if you are a Panthers fan, very infrequently, you might want to switch to college football for the rest of the year. Joy is up because Jesus got up, not because something happened to make you happy. So happiness is a symptom of circumstances. Joy is a product of perspective. So my confession is, no matter what has happened to me, God is still good. I will be grateful. Let's say that together. Come on, I know it's a little uncomfortable for some of you. I know that you don't really like to chant things out loud. It feels kind of like a cult, but we just need to say this out loud together and, and help each other get inspired about this, all right? So we're going to say it real loud on the, on the count of three. One, two, three. Happiness is a symptom of circumstances. Joy is a product of perspective. God is still good. I will be grateful. Again, happiness is a symptom of circumstances. Joy is a product of perspective. God is still good. I will be grateful. Man, perspective. Perspective. Paul gives us a perspective here. Writing the happiest book of the Bible from a prison cell. Talking about joy. And he says, we should do everything without complaining. Sometimes all we need is a little perspective. Our lead staff is going to Africa here in a couple of weeks, and I want you to make plans for two things this holiday season. I want you to plan to be in church, if possible, Thanksgiving weekend. If you're not in town, watch it online, because I'm going to be showing you a sermon from Africa. I'm going over, and we're doing some partnership stuff this holiday season in Africa with Samaritan's Purse. We're going to help a lot of people this Christmas season, and... Since we can't all go to Africa, I'm going to bring Africa to you, and I'm going to preach an entire sermon from, from Africa. And then, just got news, and this really has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just had to tell you because I'm bursting with it. Remember last year when we did an Uptown Christmas at Belk Theater? We're doing it again. This year, we're doing it two nights, two nights, more worship experience times. Last year, we saw hundreds of people come to Christ, and we're going to do it again this year on December 23rd and 24th. So I'm very excited to announce that to you. And I'm looking forward to the trip to Africa, and, and I'm not, because I think that it'll put a real perspective on a lot of the things that I complain about in a way that might challenge and convict me and make me feel really, really bad about my performance. Because if I compare myself to other people I'm always around, I feel pretty normal. But it's not until you see an abnormal level of gratitude from somebody who has every reason to complain but doesn't that you realize how small your view of the goodness of God really is. When, when we go to Africa, I'd love to share with some of the pastors over there some of the complaints that we give in our American churches some of the complaining that goes on. Like, try going over to Uganda and say, man, church is great, but just the parking. <laughs> the parking is, is sometimes, sometimes there's so many people coming to church to hear about Jesus that we have to wait eight minutes to leave the parking lot. I mean, I go to this campus uptown, and you got to find this space in the garage, and God is good, but... <sighs> To which they would reply, oh, we walk miles in the elements with worn out shoes to get to church. Do everything without complaining and argue. Well, in, in, in our church, you know, we came from another church. And, and, and see, the thing is, at Elevation Church, um, there's not enough Bible studies for us to study God's Word. They don't offer enough Bible studies to which someone in some parts of the world might respond with, oh, really? In our country, there aren't enough Bibles for everybody to have one. See, we complain and we argue, not because our circumstances are bad, because for every complaint I make about one of my circumstances, I could show you someone with a worse circumstance who's giving God more praise. It's a product of my perspective. I've somehow forgotten who God is 
in relation to who I am and what he's given in relation to what I really deserve. Yeah, well, you know, at Elevation, they don't really sing the songs I like. To which someone in Uganda may respond, at our church, we don't have instruments. Well, sometimes the preacher goes long. Well, in our situation, we call that a good day. Because it takes us five hours to get there, so we hope he has something to say when we do. We actually had someone one time, worst church complaint of all time, quit going to a certain campus because the seats weren't comfortable enough. And they had the nerve to say it. A lot of people may do that, but don't tell anybody. Just don't tell anybody. Make something else up. Tell them I was preaching heresy. Don't tell them the seats weren't comfortable enough. Someone somewhere would say, oh, that's too bad. I'd sit on a dirt floor in a mud hut to go to church. And I can't even do that in freedom. We pack into a house, and if they find out we're worshiping there, they might come and arrest us and beat us. See, it's a product of perspective, people. We complain because we don't see Jesus for who he is. We, we complain because we don't see what he's done clearly in the light of what we deserve. We should be grateful. Some of us have it so good and have so little joy, and some people have it so bad and have so much joy. And I just feel like the biggest dork in the world standing here preaching this to you. Because I complain so much. I can be such a man of God sometimes, and then I'm such a big baby. You'd be ashamed of me. <laughs> I wanted to work on my sermon a little bit Friday, and... Holly told me, remember, we have family pictures. And I said, oh, that's great. I can't wait to take family pictures with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Kill me. I mean, <laughs> great. That's awesome. And... And I, I'm thinking to myself, I don't have time to go take family pictures. I don't have time to go take family pictures. And I need to work on this sermon. And you know what? Family pictures this past Friday turned out to be the ultimate sermon preparation for a sermon on not complaining. <laughs> really did. It really did. Because I'm sitting out there and, you know, I don't care how good your kids are. And mine are perfect. But... You know, when they're four and when they're two, trying to get them to hold still and smile is like an Old Testament parting of the Red Sea miracle. And about halfway through, everybody um, wishes they'd never been born. And you, you, you're trying to smile, and you're not thinking happy thoughts. And, um, and so I'm kneeling there taking a picture, feeling real sorry for myself, and kind of... And, and, and I think Jesus spoke to me. I think he spoke to me in line with Philippians 2, 14. Do everything without complaining. Okay. And there's the impression I got. Oh, yeah, Furtick, you got it real bad. Taking Christmas pictures with your beautiful family, with two healthy boys and a gorgeous wife. Boy, life really stinks for you. <laughs> Perspective. Perspective. <laughs> I, I know you may be sick in your body, but God let you live to see another day. Somebody went to wake up this morning and couldn't. I know your commissions may have decreased a lot this year, but you'll have food to eat tonight. You'll have food to eat tonight. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Verse 15 so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. I love this imagery coming up. Please don't miss this metaphor. In which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing.
I got a question for you. When do the stars shine in the sky? All of our locations. Do they shine at night? They shine all the time. But the only time we can see them is at night. The only time we can see their brilliance is when the sky grows black. Sometimes God will allow the circumstances in your life to go dark so that he can shine forth his brilliance in your life. I had no idea all week studying how a star shining in the universe had anything to do with complaining, but now I see it. God has to let the circumstances of our lives go dark sometimes because that's the only time his light can shine through us. And I'll tell you, it really became clear to me um, on Friday afternoon after the family pictures. My oldest son, who, who just um, uh, demonstrated uh, the, the best offering collection in the history of churchianity for all of you to see. I was so proud of my little guy. Did you see that? It was phenomenal. You should give a lot of money. Please give a lot of money because that was awesome. Okay? My son is running around the house with a glow stick. And I never thought about it this way before. But he's holding this glow stick, and I'm sitting on the couch reading a book. I have all the lights on so I can see the book. And he says, Daddy... Can we turn the lights off? There's too much light in the room. I can't see my glow stick. So I turned off the lights. And the brilliance of the glow stick emerged. But only after we broke it. And so I wrote this down in my journal. Sometimes God has to break you and turn out the lights before his glory can shine through in your life. Sometimes God has to reveal the brilliance of joy against the backdrop of our pain. And I got a challenge this week for our church. I want us to all go on a seven day fast. A seven day fast. And, and here's the great thing about this fast you can eat whatever you want because we're not fasting from food. Somebody just said, thank you. I think he actually said, thank you, Jesus. All right? Gratitude. Good job. Putting it into practice. You need whatever you want because we're not going to fast from food. We're going to fast from complaining for a week. For one week. After seven days, you can let it rip. But for seven days. No, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time because I'm such a, I'm such a, Jerk, I'm so ungrateful. God's done so much for me, and I need help. So I thought we'd all do this thing together because just maybe you need help too. Just maybe you need some perspective too. So our kids' ministry, eKids, has been working, creating um, a container that we're calling the ugly jar. Bring, bring me an ugly jar. This is called the ugly jar. And we're going to help you if you choose to accept the challenge to fast from complaining and arguing for the next seven days. Um, you'll get an ugly jar, one per family, on the way out today. I want you to put your ugly jar somewhere, and they're painted to be ugly on purpose because, you know, we say ugly words. It's ugly when we complain. And um, I want to keep it simple, you know, ugly jar, ugly words, things like that. And I'm not talking about a cuss jar. I'm talking about a complaining jar. <laughs> if you want to see it, if you want to see it from a negative standpoint, it's a joy jar. It's a joy jar to help you as you, as you seek to allow the joy of Jesus to infiltrate your, your life. It's a joy jar. But mine's going to be called an ugly jar. Here's what I want you to do. Every time you complain this week, I want you to put a dollar in. And what we've done, because I thought some of you wouldn't play along, we told your kids about it in the children's ministry. We told them that we needed their help. So in just a moment, I'm going to dismiss. This is, this is the end of my sermon. In just a moment. There's, we've already taken the offering. We don't have a song. What I'm dismissing you into 
is, is a week long fast from complaining. And that every time you do complain or you hear someone complain, someone contributes a dollar to the jar. What if you don't carry cash? Then you're going to keep a tally sheet and you're going to settle up at the end of the week. Next week, when you come back to church, there will be a clearly designated area for you to drop off all the money. And we're giving it all away to one of our community outreach partners. So it's a win-win situation. Listen, if you complain, amen, amen, if you complain less, then you will be more holy. If you complain more, we get to help people in the city. So at least your sin will pay for once in your life. Your sin of complaining will bless somebody. I'm not sure how God feels about that theologically, but practically it's going to help us keep our attitudes in check. So you're going to get an ugly jar on your way out, and you're going to speak with joy this week, and you're going to challenge each other. And when you hear someone complain, and listen, listen, Every time you open your mouth, Paul says, you have an opportunity. You're either holding out the word of life or you're handing down a death sentence. Which is it going to be? You're going to speak death sentences this week? I'm so tired, that'll cost you a dollar. <laughs> Look here. Nobody wants to hear how tired you are all the time. When you talk like that all the time, People avoid you. I'm trying to help you have more friends. They don't want to know how your knees ache. They don't want to know how your shoulder hurts. So look, look. I am fully expecting that I might have to take a part-time job in order to fill my ugly jar this week. I got issues. But this much I know. My joy is not a symptom of circumstances. It's a product of my perspective. And no matter what has happened to me and no matter what has happened to you, the Apostle Paul writing from a prison cell wants us to know God is still good. So I will be grateful. One more time. God is still good. So I will be grateful. Again, God is still good. So I will be grateful. Let's clap our hands. Thank you so much for being here this weekend. If you're watching online today and you call Elevation Church home, let me remind you that you can always take advantage of our online giving option. On the homepage, there's also a link in the upper right-hand corner that says online giving. Click there. It's an easy way to stay up to date with all of your regular giving. And of course, some of you are probably watching from somewhere else in the country altogether. If you feel led to give today to support the work that's happening through this ministry, please do so. Use that same online giving link. We want to say thanks to everyone who partners with us in the gospel. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.